My name is uh, Oliver Krause, and I'm a postdoc at the EFL, at the Leibniz Institute for uh, Regional Geography. And I'm working on a project on traveling imaginations, uh, the reception, perception, and popularization of the heartland concept of Hedford John McKinder. So my panel was uh, about that topic, about geopolitics and the revival of uh, geopolitics at the moment. And we were, uh, on the one hand, talking about uh, geopolitics and the revival of geopolitics. On the other hand, we were talking about uh, specific strategic narratives, which are uh, connected to that geopolitics, which pop up every time when there is a crisis, uh, destabilization, and process of re- and deterritorialization, which are connected then to uh, geopolitical concepts, which were instrumentalized to legitimize in the end uh, specific policies uh, which uh, try to uh, in the end legitimize expansions of specific states, ethnicities and so on. The key takeaways uh, were that you can see, so we have uh, we had two panels which were directly um, looking at the instrumentalization of uh, geopolitical concepts and uh, you saw that there, especially that concept I'm working on, uh, this Hartson concept, is uh, really coming up when there is a kind of crisis. So uh, like you see in the uh, 1950s, 1960s, uh, the Cold War, it was used by the US to legitimize uh, the uh, policy against uh, the communism. And uh, nowadays it's uh, used by Putin and Alexander Dugin to um, legitimize the Russian expansion. and. Um, uh, Stefan Rodewald uh, showed that there are also uh, kind of strategic narratives connected to that. So like uh, Russian worlds, uh, Serbian world, which are also connected to that narrative of Mackinder and geopolitical ideas. And um, what we see uh, also, and which uh, was an outcome of that session, was that you uh, could see that uh, this concept is really used or usable from different points of views. Because in, in Germany in the 20s and 30s, uh, they used it as an utopian uh, concept to legitimize uh, German world power domination. And in the US, it was a dystopian um, concept to say we have to contain Soviet Union and communism. And so I think uh, it's an example where you could show that you could tell, uh, based on that concept, different stories of globalization, how globalization works so from a different point of view. because. Both of them, the Germans and um, the Americans, build on that idea, on that concept, the kind of um, imagined future world order, how the world should look like. So, and I think that uh, also connects a bit to the to the topic of the of the conference when you think about the global condition in the end. So, what does geopolitics have to do with global conditions? So, you see that it's it is a concept, or these are concepts, geopolitical concepts which could be instrumentalized in uh, the process of globalization from different angles. And uh, everyone is able from a national perspective to instrumentalize geopolitics um, from an own perspective because they are mostly um, very simple. Uh, most of them are geographically deterministic and uh, very uh, not many factors inside that concept so that they are adaptable to everyone who wants to use them to legitimize specific policies. So welcome to all of you, so especially to those two in the Zoom. <laughs> Um, to the uh, panel, um, the title Revival of Geopolitics. Um, first, I will tell you a bit about briefly what we are trying to do in the panel and um, then we will um, have a kind of chronicle order in all the presentations. Um, we are only the three of us so because of that we have a lot of time and I think we would uh, do it that way that we um, have presentations to 20 to 25 minutes. After each presentation we will have a discussion. Um, um, and you could also um, ask questions from the chat and uh, or in the chat and uh, could ask questions by audio in the chat and um, you could do it in English or German, it's uh, how you like. Uh, and then we were able also to wrap up the 
whole panel at the end after the three presentations. So what we will do on the panel, uh, I think, uh, are three things. Uh, first, we will have a look on the emergence of a geopolitical concept in a transnational context of Great Britain, the German and Reich, and uh, the US. And um, second, we scrutinize uh, the narrative of Russian world and Serbian world as uh, the intellectual basis of new imperialism in Serbia and Russia. And third, uh, we will have a look on the emergence of geo. Uh, third, we will have um, to analyze uh, spatial and economic practices in Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan. I will then introduce um, the speakers before their presentation so that you all know um, who, who is speaking to you. So um, I will start because I will do the presentation on the geopolitical concept. So it's quite a bit of a a basis for, for, the, for the panel. And um, yeah, those who do not know me, I, my name is Oliver Krausen, and I received my PhD here in the University of Leipzig with a thesis on Dutch states building process in the 17th century. And since 2017, I'm a research assistant at the Leibniz Institute for Regional Geography and the Department of Theory, Methods and History of Geography. And from February um, 2020 until January 23, I do have an own research project founded by the FG on uh, traveling imaginations, perception, adaptation, and popularization of the heartland concept of health of the kinder between uh, 94 and the 1950s, with the focus on Great Britain, Germany, and the US. And today's talk uh, is kind of an attempt to generalize the first outcomes of the project and using them to analyzing the contemporary revival of geopolitics. So I will now start with the presentation. Okay, um, the view of, uh, or the title of the, the, the uh, presentation will be uh, the revival of the Hartland concept patterns of dystopian and utopian world orders. Um, in view of satellite images documenting the deployment of the Russian army on the Ukraine border, Swiss journalist and author Eric Guyer, in an article on Saturday edition of the New York Zurich Zeitung on February 19th, no longer had any doubts that Russia's attack on Ukraine was imminent. A few days later, war was raging in Ukraine. Already within the speculation about a future war, analysis of what motives might be driving Putin to start a war in the middle of Europe popped up. Guia resorted to familiar, a familiar geopolitical argument to explain Putin's actions. I quote, presumably, however, photographs taken from an altitude of 36,000 kilometers are of less help than, uh, he, uh, less help here than considerations that uh, geostrategists already made at the beginning of the last century. At that time, the region landmass supercontinent consisting of Europe and Asia was the focus of interest. The geographer Halford McKinder claimed whoever controlled it would rule the world. Since China started to catch up, Eurasia has become even more important. It is home to 5 billion people who generate two thirds of the world's gross domestic product. Today, even more than 100 years ago, the saying is true, whoever controls the supercontinent controls the world. This gives Russia, which has recovered uh, from a Soviet, post-Soviet weakness, new opportunities. There is no doubt that Putin wants to give Russia a place as a great power alongside the US and China, who would end. The highly technologized observation of the military buildup leaves us stunned in our inability to respond without being able to provide a rational. How can a concept drafted over 100 years ago by a British geographer help us better understand Putin's motivation for a aggressive war in the 21st century? To understand why this war is taking place, Guya points to a long tradition of geopolitical and geostrategic thinking, which Putin now seems to instrumentalize as an argument for Russia's claims to be a world power. The presentation will first deal with health of the kingdom's geopolitical concepts, which is widely known as the Hartland concept. And a second step, the reception and adaption of the Hartland concept in the German Reich and the United States in the 1930s and 1940s will be discussed in order to show how the complexity of the concept was reduced by its translation from text to map and how thus became a free flowing explanatory pattern that was repeatedly used to explain geopolitical concepts and conflicts beyond epoch and situation specific contexts. Above all, the categorical representation made the heartland into an allegory for the threat to the liberal democratic world order posed by totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. 
what should become clear through the individual aspects of the presentation and the synthesis is the oscillation of the concept between utopia and dystopia, which points to the variability to instrumentalize the Heartland concept in different contexts. The paper refers to the theoretical and methodological debates on imaginative uh, geographies by uh, Derek Gregory, who refers to Foucault, saying that not only that uh, not only space is part of the imagination, but also a specific knowledge power relation within that space. And the main theoretical argument of the paper is based on Michael C. Frank's approach of imaginative geographies as a traveling concept, which assumes that spatial imaginaries uh, are determined by whom and where they are created, which gives them a uh, mutability at the end of which new levels of meaning of the imaginaries emerge. The central motive of uh, the Heartland concept is a large area that McKinder called in the lecture to the Royal Geographic Society in 1904, the geographic pivot area of history. The pivot area was located in Northern Asia, extending to Middle East and Western provinces of Russia. Crucial was the idea that the domination of a large area, which had no access to ice free helpers, offered the potential for the dominator to rise to a status of a major political power, provided that it succeeded in making the available raw materials usable through the expansion of transport routes and the industrialization of the region by means of growing population. In a second version, of the concept published in 1919, McKinder renamed the pivot area to Heartland. If the Heartland was dominated, the regional superpower could become the hegemon of the world through intermediate steps by conquering adjacent territories. First, Eastern Europe, later the entire European and Asian continent, and finally the World Island, consisting of Europe, Asia, and Africa. The expansion would provide access to the world's oceans via the ice-free forts and then land power into and then turn the land power into an amphibious world power dominating a new world order. Kinder saw this scenario as the inevitable end of history unless an alliance could be forged against the Hardlands ruler. And to follow Kinder's line of thought in this uh, as to why expansion beyond the Hardland would be inevitably a cure, attentions must be focused on the geographical determinism of the concept. When McKinnon speaks of a threat to Europe from the nomads of the steppe or the Chinese in 1904, he cites historical analogy is to demonstrate that threats of Europe always arose from the East. From Genghis Khan to the Ottomans, equestrian peoples threatened the Occident. McKinder attributes this to the environmental conditions in which the nomads grew up. The soil did not provide enough food for a growing population. The climate created conditions that affected the character traits of the equestrian peoples. Their natural environment made the equestrian people conquerors, and this explicit urge to conquer was the prerequisite for expansion beyond the borders of the heartland. And as Jared told Jerry Kearns and Brian Bleuet and several publications mentioned, McKinder wrote in 1904 from the perspective of a British imperialist who wants to draw attention to the threat posed to the British naval power and the whole empire, by a region land power, which was hardly listened to since Russia was, uh, which was in charge of the heartland at that moment, in particular seemed very fragile after the Russian-Japanese war and was not considered a threat. So the concept did not appeal to the British public or British politici politicians. Um, and also on the European continent, there were no reactions on the geopolitical dystopia before World War uh, I. The situation changed after uh, World War II. Um, it can change the concept under the impression of the Germans, Germany's ambition to become a great power. But this uh, did not change the basic orientation of the concept. Only the ethnic group that McKinnon believed could dominate the greater region was different in his book, Democratic Idiots and Reality, from 1990. And whereas in 1904, McKinnon believed that the nomads of the Asian steppes, the Chinese would dominate the region in 1990, he saw the Germans and Slavs as potential rulers of the heartland. Germans were considered by him in 1990 to be the more threatening nation of the two, whose expansionist policies were supposedly based on the combination of Prussian militarism and Fichte's philosophy. And in an alliance between Germans and Slavs, according to McKinder, lay the greatest danger to the existing world order. With McKinnon's decision that the threat of the existing world order no longer come from the Western peoples of the staff or the Chinese, but from Germans and Slavs, also, the motives of the expansion changed. And McKinder's um, 1919 version of the concept cites cultural fact factors for German expansionism. 
And the turn from a geographical deterministic to a culturalist and ideological arguments opened up the, an entirely new reading of the concept. So he himself showed that the motives for um, the expansionist drive were interchangeable. And the map shows that Mackinder also served the heartlands, weird, the heartlands ties to the Northern Asia in 1990. He created um, in 1990 um, a second heartland in Africa, and this made the territorial reference to the concept flexible too. It was the flexibility of the concept that Mackinder himself inscribed in it that made the concept adaptable later. What Mackinder succeeded in doing in democratic Guinea as a reality, in addition to differentiating the concept and modifying the expansion's motive, uh, was to summarize the Hartland's concept in a formula, which along with the cartographic illustration contributed to the concept popularity. The lasting impact of the formula is also shown by Eric Guia's article, which uh, drew for on the formula without fully reproducing it. And the more intensive examination of the reorganization of Europe made the formula connectical to national strategies and political thoughts in post-war Europe. And you could say that uh, it was the searching, groping for a new order that led to the intensive reception and adaption of the concepts in times of crisis after the First World War. The Heartland concept offered further space for interpretation as the adaption of the German geographical Haushofer in the 1920s showed. Haushofer, the doyen of German geopolitics and editor of the Zeitschrift for Geopolitik, referred almost exclusively to the 1904 draft concept, as did few after him, even though he was familiar with the book of 1990, he did not refer to it for understandable reasons, because McKinsey portrayed the Germans as a threat to European peace and as warmongers. Haushofer was intrigued by the idea of a continental bloc that could form, could be formed by the German Reich, Italy, the Soviet Union, and joined by Japan as a naval power in the East, and thus forming a decisive counterweight to Britain. However, had spent some time in Japan as a military advisor and had earned his doctorate on Japanese rise as an East Asian power in the university at the University of Munich, where he later became professor. And crucial to Hausdorff's adaption of the Heartland concept was the transformation of the uh, dystopia of McKinder into a pseudo scientific utopia of German world power. Hausdorff argued for an alliance of the Third Reich and the Soviet Union, but um, had no part in bringing about the uh, German Soviet non aggression pact, just as he generally had uh, very little direct influence on the foreign policy in the Third Reich. Um, what McKinder accomplished was the reinterpretation of the Heartland concept. He saw the concept as a guide to German world domination and a new world order from the perspective of an utopian narrative. He created a further dimension for the reception and adaption which is currently used above all by neo-right intellectuals in Germany, but also by Putin's spin doctor, let's say, Alexander Dugin. In the reinterpretation of the concept, uh, the spatial imagination of a larger area uh, to be dominated as a prerequisite for the rise to the world power once again takes on a central role in contemporary times. So now I come to the second part where I show you how the concept was adapted in the US. To understand how the spatial imagination could become an allegory, the transnational transfer of knowledge in the course of the reception of the Hartland concept and the associated translation of text into map into, in the US must be brought in focus. McKinnon's concept was hardly known beyond the professional circles of geographers in the US before World War II. One of the exceptions was Newton D. Baker, Secretary of War, under Woodrow Wilson, who justified US intervention in World War I in the 1936 article, Why We Went to War in Foreign Affairs, referring to McKinley's democratic ideas and a reality only in a footnote. Um, while working on the article, he was corresponded with the geographer Isaiah Bowman, who rejected McKinley's concept because of its inherent determinism. And that was the problem uh, in, uh, in the US, because a lot of um, American geographers thought that this concept of uh, McKinder was too deterministic, and they were more into political geography, but not into that kind of geopolitics, what Germans did. Um, McKinder's, however, McKinder's book, Democratic Idiots, did not go completely unnoticed among reviewers in the US, the newspapers. 
and the Sun. Um, a book review appeared in 1990 in which McKinnis warning that the German Reich was unlikely to succeed in taking the heartland was already mentioned. However, the most crucial, most crucial for the reception of the history of the uh, most crucial to the reception history of the heartland concept in the U.S. was uh, the conclusion of the German Soviet Non-Aggression Pact in August 1939. What McKinder had um, warned about in 1990. And how Soviet had worked toward had become the past. Germans and Slavs had united, and the alliance made McKinder a geopolitical prophet overnight. And the heart and concept, the blueprint for a dystopian teleology of world history. However, whoever dominates the heartland threatens the democratic liberal order of the world. Less than two months later, on October 1st, 1939, Rich Day Stokes published an article in the Evening Post identifying German's geopolitics and making this formula from uh, the Book of 1990 as cues for the German Soviet alliance. And this was the beginning of the intensive examination of the Heartland concept in the US as a dystopian prophecy of a totalitarian world order under Hitler's leadership that had to be prevented at all costs. And which indicated that the stigmatization of the Heartland concept as the intellectual basis of striving for world power in the name of extremist ideologies could be used as an argument to legitimize political and military actions against actors and states committed to this goal. And this figure of thought uh, of threatening ideology as striving for world power domination was transferred in the US to the threat of communism um, to the democratic liberal world after World War II. McKinder had prepared the change of modes by himself. And after World War II, it was no longer national socialism, but communism that made the heart and the basis of its claims uh, to world domination. The domination of the imagined heartland in the name of totalitarian and autocratic political systems became a symbol for the global threat to Western values. In the US public discourse, the allusion to the Heartland concept is referred to legitimize the intervenience of US forces in regional and global conflicts in the first decades of the Cold War, which had been justified against traditions of isolationism and the modern doctrine. Numerous articles and books appeared in the US in the 1940s devoted to the concept and its significance for German warfare and ensured its popularity. One factor that favored reception and rapid adaption of the Heartland concept in the US was at the, uh, let's say, semantic or linguistic level, uh, because the term Heartland or the word Heartland was already a widespread lexeme in American English before World War I. And among other things, it functioned as a proper noun. And on the other hand, it was already used to designate large areas in the United States. So the Midwest was already uh, considered as the American Heartland. And therefore, it was hardly surprising that the debate over the Heartland concept very quickly filled the political feuilletons of American newspapers and popular magazines. There was a tendency to locate an American Heartland in the Midwest at the counter pole of, American, of uh, McKinder's Heartland in Asia, which could be the basis for the American world power that must be, succeed against the dominators of the Heartland in the old world. The argument of the representative of Alaska, Admiral Lewis Bartlett, in a speech in the House in June 18, 1984, 948, that North America had its own heartland, Koran, even during the Cold War. In the 1950s, authors such as Dorothy Thompson in her numerous articles for the Evening Star and McKinley's geopolitical concept repeatedly alluded to the American heartland as needed to be protected from the Soviet attack as well as the need to think strategically about how to threaten the enemy's heartland to maintain a deterrence scenario. And Thompson referred to McKinsey's heartland concept in the articles until the idea had entered the public's toolkit for analyzing foreign policy relations. In that course of the multi-layered reception process uh, between 19, 19, uh, 1939 and the 1950s, there was what Uta Waldenga described as a reduction of the complexity of the Heartland concept, which was achieved primarily through the approbated representation of the concept in newspapers and magazine articles, as well as through popular maps that were attached to them. In some of these maps, uh, like you see now on the left side, um, you can see which influence the air age did have on the reception of the Heartland concept in the US. Only with the possibility of crossing the North Pole with long range bombers 
that the heartland of the World Island posed a threat to the North American continent in the U.S. heartland and to the uh, U.S. heartland. It is evident that the cartographic depiction of the heartland concept condensed it into an allegory uh, for the threat to the democratic liberal world. And however, heartland also functioned as a metaphor for an imagined large area that, thanks to rich natural resources, deposits, and increased industrialization, could become a power center for a political entity which in significant ties to a particular political regime. The spatial metaphor had broken away from the original red regionally well-defined attachment to a large area in Asia and the motives McKinder had attributed to the people's drive for expansion. And the spatial metaphor that emerged was uh, conceived as a center of both a dystopian and an utopian world order, and thus had many uh, uses. So Nazi politics of Lebensraum in Eastern Europe and Soviet communism became ideological motives of expansion. In the US, since the 1950s, the fight against communism could be legitimized in the public with reference to the heartland concept only by mentioning the term heartland, and as the Reich geopoliticians saw the uh, heartland as the center of a continental bloc that would establish uh, the Germanized position as a world power in, in the utopian world order. And there you could see that this concept could be used in, in very uh, different ways and that it's possible to tell a story with that concept of different kinds of world order. So it's maybe also uh, the possibility to tell stories of different globalizations, so from different perspectives. And if we relate uh, what has been said at the beginning of Putin's aspirations, the heartland concept emerges as a revenant, seems to expose Putin's true goals as a sufficient explanatory pattern, especially since references to the concepts can be found in the renewal of Eurasianism by Alexander Dugin, uh, like I said, also at the beginning. Uh, but it is unlikely to be possible to fully explain the current war in Putin's policies with the help of the geopolitical concept. Because the main pitfall of using the hard, uh, and, uh, concept is an, as an explanatory narrative is that it predicts a teleological historical process with an inevitable end. So the concept includes a geographical based philosophy of history. Therein lies the longevity of the concept. The drama inherited in such an ending as described by the Heartland concept may hide senses of the war's extraordinary significance for Europe and the world and strengthen the power of resistance, but it also limits the options of actions uh, since one is certain that Putin will pull out all stops of warfare up to and including the use of atomic bombs to achieve its uh, planned goals. At the end, I would say the revival of uh, geopolitics and the heartland concept in recent decades suggests how rehearsed spatial imaginaries and, and imagined world order continue to inform the analysis of global crisis, conflicts, and war, and the importance of deconstructing them in order to develop flexible and variable policy, policy responses. The heartland concept is revived in the Western world when there are regional or global conflicts that leads to the destabilization of spatial orders. In 2008 financial crisis, the Hartland concept did not even, did not even play a role in the problem solving debate as the spatial order continued to prevail. But in Russia's attack on Ukraine, the spatial order of Europe, uh, but also the global power order was challenged, but led to the immediate recourse to the concept. It provides simple, comprehensible, and geographical deterministic answers to questions of future spatial and political orders in processes of de- and re -territorialization. And in my opinion, the concept will uh, remain alive because the threat of its prophecies uh, will always exist. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Okay, so now we have time for questions from the chat or from people here in the room. Uh, well, then my question would be, uh, you know, um, there, are, there have been a lot of different spatial concepts emerging in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Why do you think the present concept is so kind of persistent? Um, yeah, I had a look on the reception and adaption, and I have seen that um, they're also uh, in France, Germany, Great Britain, 
Um, there's also a kind of a reflection in uh, Soviet Union, but they say, okay, there's no, um, that's not a concept which uh, fits to, com fit to communism because we think that uh, men is uh, the yeah. factor for bringing history forth and uh, forward. And um, because of that, I think there is, uh, you can see uh, that it's a concept which is really adapted and percepted in really a lot of countries all over the uh, 20th century. And there is um, this big, um, let's say, reception in Germany in the 20s and 30s, not only by Karl Haushofer, there are a lot of other geopoliticians. And it's really, like I said, a kind of a reaction uh, in Germany uh, onto the um, uh, Treaty of Versailles, that there was uh, these um, changes in the territory order of Germany. And this was kind of an answer for the Germans, and because of that has become really prevalent that concept. So there are other concepts, but I'm not concentrating on that. Because... Why do you think? So you think that the system that we still see is a survival of the politics, and that do get also reference to Hartman often. You see the roots of it in in the German uh, reunification first, right? Mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. Say, yeah. Oh. yeah, yeah, I see that. So we have the two, two different, uh, like I said, um, interpretations of that. You have in Germany that idea that is an utopian yeah. uh, concept, uh, which produced a lot of German kind of world power using that and controlling the heartland. And then you have that idea in the US who think, who in the end um, did not uh, read uh, the uh, real um, original papers of McKinder, but he, they, they wrote it through the um, reception of the Germans. So they, really yeah, rereading. And so they thought, okay, we have to do something against that geopolitical policy in Germany because they thought that uh, the Nazi policy in Eastern Europe is driven by that. And so they're trying to find an answer. And because of that, they were interested in that concept, but they uh, thought it is a dystopian uh, concept. So, yeah, because of that there are two different um, ways of interpreting it. I also have a question. Yeah. Too. Um, the first one, uh, I would like to know more about how you transfer the idea of the heartland and the debates around the heartland traveling in time into globalization. Mm -hmm. This is the first one. And the second one is. Uh, I'm wondering, like you mentioned critical geopolitics, but then as I understand your like your analysis and your your like your analytical sensitivity is much more um, on the grounds of classical geopolitics. So where do you really see the deconstructive moment or um, how do you like is this Part of your intention to also critically look at the term from the perspective of critical geopolitics, because then you would need a couple of more perspectives and mm -hmm. nuances, no? Mm -hmm. Dealing with the term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, uh, first uh, question on uh, how I would uh, look from the perspective of globalization to that. I think um, the idea is to say that it's really. Um, inherent in the concept that it's uh, a thinking of globalization within that concept. Because they think of a new imagined future world order, that's the one aspect. And the other um, aspect is that I, uh, what I said before, that it's really a concept which um, circulates really uh, um, global. So it's a, a way of a global knowledge transfer. And you could see how, uh, or you could show that, how global knowledge transfer works, how it functions. And uh, like I said, that tr transformation of text into map, that uh, with that transformation or translation, there comes a lot of complexity with that concept. And then it's easier to, to translate it. And then it becomes like a, a global metaphor, because it's not only, uh, like I said, in the countries I mentioned already, but it's also uh, used in uh, nowadays, it's also used in uh, South America. In some countries they refer to that concept. So you can see that it's really a, a global um, or originally a European concept of an imperialist British geographer, uh, which in the end 
becomes global because everyone um, makes uh, his or her own story of it. So putting it in a, in a national context, and I think you could show that uh, this globalization in a way uh, works then also on the, on the national level because they used it, global uh, circulation of knowledge, but then it was translated to a kind of national uh, narrative, but within a global context. So that's, that's maybe the, the, the first question. And the second question, um, the critical geopolitics, um, I think the, the idea for me is to first um, see the processes of um, reception, adaption, and popularization. So I'm more interested in the process of how um, scientific knowledge um, is popularized. So how it comes to really that, uh, like I said, a lot of newspapers wrote about that topic. So how does this work? And I'm also maybe interested in uh, looking at the deconstruction of the concept, but not um, that much um, from the uh, really point of view from the critical geopolitics to, because um, I think uh, you could refer to that because it has more or less all said about that. So in geopolitics, what um, it's about, about these classical geopolitics, they all already deconstructed it. So you could, could refer to that, but I think it's not even necessary to do it again or to do it from another uh, point of view, because I think that would be not so much more um, new stuff to see. For me, it's more interesting to see how it uh, was populated or popularized. So. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the question is, uh, I would be interested to hear some more and how McKinsey's concept influenced uh, the thinking of doing. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> spoken a lot about that last days. Um, so for me, it was only a, it was a kind of um, starting point to, 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 to have a connection to the um, ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I'm not really an expert with Dugin and his thinking, but there is, um, Dugin um, uses this Hartland theory to build up uh, this idea of originism and makes the idea of the Hartland and uh, also this um, argument of ethnicity, uh, which was part of the first version of McKinsey's concept in 1904. Um, he makes it as a factor for this new um, um, idea of Stefan Rodebert will talk maybe about that later, um, the Russian world. So that's, that's a kind of a, a basic idea. But the other thing is that, uh, yeah, I think nobody really knows how and in, in which uh, form he influences the politics of Putin really. So there's no, no real... I think there's a real connection to see, but there are similarities between that what Putin says and that what Putin does. And yeah, and so I think the the, the influence on, on Dugin is more, um, let's say, the idea of he takes the idea from the from the, from the first version from 1904, when there is the idea more concentrated by um, uh, Mackinder on the on the heartland, on Asia, on uh, that um, nomads of the steppe. So it's more a connection to that idea of uh, a new Russian imperialism than the second uh, word. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I would like to add that uh, in the period till the 50s and 60s, and I did um, 
my uh, research is concentrated on, let's say, the Western world and also to Russia. So I can't say really much about that. I'm not an expert in, in, on geographical society of Russia and the ongoing debate at the moment. But um, yeah, the only thing I, I could tell you about that, so I talked yesterday to a student or a PhD student here from, from Leipzig who came from Russia and he said that, that it's um, Dugin and uh, Geopolitics uh, is part of the curricula of uh, at German at uh, Russian universities, so there is a kind of institutionalization of that uh, knowledge about the art and about Dugin. And I think uh, when you when you see that, I think uh, you could also find then uh, references in journals and magazines to that, because when it's implemented in universities, there should be any reaction in other media. And um, when they when they know about it, there is the possibility to refer also to that in media and in newspapers and so on. But I, I guess that it is the case, but I could not tell you uh, if it's really yeah. the case. Yeah, I also have another question there. Maybe we go on with the heartland debate at the end because this seems to be the most yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we can debate them now, but just yeah. Because they're like all of us are talking about the heartland yeah, in yeah. one way or another. Maybe we can collect. We can collect that at the end. Uh, and then yeah, because I think debate. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you for for the questions, and then we'll turn to uh, Stefan Rodewald. I will introduce him briefly to you. Um, Professor Rodewald uh, studied history. Yeah. Slavic literary, literature and social, economic, uh, social and economic history at the University of Zurich. He received uh, his PhD with a thesis on the collective action of social groups in Venice at the University of Zurich. And in 2012, he habitated on religious memory figures, the Orthodox South slaves until uh, 1944 at the University of Passau, where he uh, also worked as a research assistant at the Church of modern and contemporary history of uh, Eastern Europe and its cultures since 2006. Before becoming professor of Eastern and Southeastern European history at the University of Leipzig in 2020, he had the chair of Southeastern European history at the University of Gießen for seven years. Um, and as I could see from his uh, publication list and project titles, uh, Professor Odewald's interest in the last year is focused on uh, trans Ottomanic, trans Ottomanic interaction contexts. Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg Empire. And uh, 2019, he published together with uh, Stefan Konemann and Albrecht Fuß the anthology Trans Ottomanica East European Ottoman Persian Mobility Dynamics. So I'm very glad to have you here and I'm um, very much looking forward to, to your presentation. And so I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And Trans Ottomanica is about Russia, Persia, and mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. the Ottoman not only Habsburg. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, to some degree, I'm building on your introduction. On the other hand, I have a parallel mission. The Ruski Mir is somewhere, is to some degree another concept, but as, as Dugin really is popularized and known, I can. Um, I think it makes sense to have such a focus at, even in this concept, in this um, panel, uh, Russian and Serbian worlds legitimate neo-imperialism neo or small power imperialism and more, whatever this means, by a cultural and other missions. Um, if you look at the concept of the Ruski Mir or the Russian world or Russian peace, this means the same or the Russian community and the Russian sense of the peasant community. Um, the discourse, of course, is embedded in pan-Slavism in the 19th century, begins in the middle of the 19th century, and it um, remains uh, um, important until the revolution. Um, the Serbian world is a translation effect already in the 19th century. This also developed since the 1880s, first in Novi Sad, this means um, Hungary, and then 1908 in the Serbian context, for example, with journals like these. Um, this already is a global condition before the world war. 
and spatial literacy or spatial scripts are evolving with these concepts already before the First World War. We have then a break, um, or we have the, the evolution of Eurasianism with, after the First World War and the Soviet Union, and actually only after 1991, we have in the Russian context a revitalization of the discourse about the Ruski Mir. And actually, it's in 2006, as President Putin evoked the concept and made, made it his um, wish to that this would be pushed and Afterwards, actually in 2007, just one year later, the foundation of the grant um, was institutionalized. This was came here with a um, journal behind it. This was conceived actually in parallel to the British Council or the um, Goethe Institute or Confucius Institute um, on a cultural level, on a language course level. And this can be compared um, in the activities. And so there's a cultural mission in a um, not so much problematic point uh, or level. On the other hand, uh, Ruskinir um, means also um, Russian influence and then in the, in the countries nearby to Russia, um, it has another meaning than in the global condition. In the global condition, it's a transnational, transreligious concept comparable to the Francophonia concepts on the British Council. But in the near abroad to Russia, it has another meaning and it's closely connected to imperialistic concepts. And this then brings in Alexander Dugin, who also published about the Russian idea or the Russian Mir, the Russian world, of course, and, and is also conceived as this in the near abroad or in Ukraine at the moment also, and is seen as an ideologist of the Russian world. And although to some these bridges are not all the time evident, these are quite to some degree parallel discourses. Um, as you mentioned, Dugin, I inserted past several slides about Dugin to make sure, yes, he works with Mackinder. Yes, he has this um, hardcore um, approach or this core approach to the old world, which is important for him. That's a state of the art, which, um, but also his own texts, of course, make clear he works with Mackinder. Um, that's that's no discard. There's no, there's no point about this. Um, and the near imperialistic context of Dugin is also evident. So this there's no speculation or over interpretation if we call Dugin a ultra right wing um, neo imperialist um, ideology ideologist, the Eurasian empire, as he sees it in the local and the global situation versus the heartland theory, also in the English and in the Russian version. His books were used actually um, since 1998 at the Academy of the Military in Moscow as textbooks, um, at least this was his state of the arts. 14 years ago, um, and he works with um, the Axis terminology, um, Iran is important for him, uh, and um, it's a multi-central, multi-plural, <laughs> um, multi-polar um, globalistic approach, of course, situated within discussions about globalization. That's the global condition, of course. Back to the Ruski Mir on its cultural mission level, uh, um, Russian language courses are important, or the education of children, etc. That's the um, not really um, dangerous part of the disguising mission, if I would call it like that. Um, and on the same page, it's already connected to history, or the, the images of history and mental maps. Um, of course, this is part of the publications of the 
um, journal Ruski Mir, and again the continuation of this governmental support um, goes on until today. And um, Putin several times supported the concept. There were several um, conjunctures or um, some said that the, the, the concept wasn't important anymore um, in the last eight years or so. But on the other hand, this institutionalizing continued and um, it was ready to be enforced again. So there's a new um, conjunct, there's a new wave of Ruskimir texts since the last two years, one could say like this. That's what, this would be my guess. Um, all this is context to globalization debates. It's about the place of, um, of Russia in the world. And this, is the cons this is the answer, the Russian globalization within globalization. There's a theoretical discussion about this in this journal, the, um, um, the century of globalization. That's the name of the journal. And this contribution is the Ruskimir and the globalization. Um, the self perception is uh, Russia and its um, and the countries which are collaborating or which are enemies. That's the that's the self that's the question. And Russia has been asking at least since to, in the last ten years, which countries can be um, worked with and which are countries have to be seen as enemy countries. That's the self-definition also within a branch of the interpretation of the Ruskimir besides the um, cultural arguments. But this, these are interwoven. And again, uh, another example for the definition of the Ruskimir within processes of globalization. I have to be, I have to hurry up a little bit. And um, with the ongoing war, with the beginning of the intensification of the, the full-scale in invasion of Ukraine in February, two days afterwards, there was for a short time on Ria Novosti um, a message about the beginning of the new world. This would have been the case if the war would have been successful, but it has not been successful. And this message or this text was then eliminated uh, half an hour later, but it's still accessible on the archive of the web. It would have been the victory of the Russian world as this contributor, which is who is known and who continues to write for the university and <laughs> claimed um, the real picture which is evolving, uh, what Russia should be doing with Ukraine is um, actually to dissolve Ukraine, to demilitarize, to have um, people's republics, to institutionalize the Russian civilization, and to eliminate actually in a physical way the Yehushka or the elites of Ukraine who are not able to follow the Russian path. So there's these uh, are genocidal aspects uh, and on a state media outlet, Ria Novosti, um, if the definition of genocide is not to kill everybody, but the but group within the group um, or to eliminate the con conception of, um, of a people and this is about the elimination of the concept of the Ukrainian people, then this is about genocide. Um, within the journal Ruskimir, which I presented until now as somewhat um, measured or um, um, not so aggressive, nevertheless, the war of Russia against Ukraine is perceived also in the latest number. We have again a globalization moment um, reflected in this journal. Everything the world around us has changed with the um, support of the rest of the world for Ukraine. That's the attack on Russia from this point of view. And if we survive, it depends on us. So it is. Um, survival situation now for this Russian civilization. Um, the whole world has been changed and is now under in a new condition. That's the definition within, again, this cultural mission and um, discourse. 
which is focusing on Ukraine at the same time. So the same quite uh, the, um, neutral or cultural missionary aspects um, are also evolving with a focus on Ukraine. You have language courses now on the side of Ruski in Ukraine. Um, uh, the ironic of this point is that the website is a European Union website. Um, cultural events which are uh, organized at the moment fit to this cultural mission. It's about classical music, but it's also about um, history and the situation of the Russian state in, in the whole region, inner internal Rus Russia phobia is defined as the most important danger for the Russian statehood on this in this context of the Russian world in Ukraine. Um, or the victory in the Second World War, well, we know this from the text of Putin, is important also in this uh, co um, context, of course. But then again, the, the day of the theater, which will be a, a cultural mission again, which is closely connected to the um, to war at, at, at the moment and which can't, can't be um, seen in another context anymore. Um, Ukrainian cultural politics, of course, reacts on the concept of the Russian world. This is nothing new, but in the context uh, as of today, and um, even the replacement of Pushkin by Kotyarevsky um, is seen as, a, as an act of survival within the Ukrainian context and as an act of attack or the xenophobia, Russia phobia from the Russian point of view. So these are two points of globalization in Ukraine at the moment. The Russian world has a religious dimension, which I'm skipping for today, totally patriarch Kirill and his speeches are known. And there's a reaction on this also. So the, um, um, doctrine of the Russian world has been um, declared a heresy or heretic um, by, a by a congregation which, with the name public orthodoxy in, in a global um, observation perspective, the Russian world has been declared a heretic movement within the religious content, so based on the speeches of Patriarch Kirill, especially. Second and last part, I actually I don't know how much time I have left. I can, I can be quicker now. The Serbsky Siet uh, or the Serbian world is a parallel um, involvement, of course, parallel and the translation of the Russian world, which is much more important at the moment, but actually in the 19th century, the Serbian world was more explicit in its um, interpretation of the cultural aims or of the um, political aims in Southeastern Europe than the Russian world, which was maybe less explicit in the newspapers as I read it by now. Um, at the moment, the Serbian world plays, a, plays an important role in the government of Vucic and especially the internal minister for internal affairs. Vulin is working with the concept, um, although it's directly also contacted, connected to Alexander Vucic and the, the critique of the concept um, which is a proof of the profileration of the concept is coming from Montenegro or Bosnia Herzegovina and also from Macedonia, which see themselves, of course, in the focus of um, Serbian expansionism. The Serbian world is conceived in the Serbian context, um, context as a legitimation of its own survival, again, as the Russian world. And the context is the 
genocide in the Second World War, Yasenovats, but also um, the denial of the genocide in Bosnia, Srebrenica, which are both mentioned in this text um, I'm screening at the moment on the portal Serbian World. Um, so if I skipped genocide from the title of my presentation, actually in both cases, it's con connected to con the concepts which play a role. I think in the Serbian case, it's more, it's more explicit with the term genocide mm -hmm. in a um, competitive uh, situation. In the Russian case, it doesn't need much over speculation to, to put the dots together. <laughs> and if Russia claimed there was a genocide on Russian people in Ukraine, well, um, uh, the court in Den, in Den Haag quite quickly said, no, that's not the case. In, in opposites, they are now investigating Russian war crimes in Ukraine. So state prosecutors from Den Haag, etc., are gathering um, material and the Russian media are working on the case by publishing pr procedures or um, handbook like um, um, tips what to do with Ukraine in, 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 in the state media or television. Macedonia would be another expansion of the Serbian world, but that is not yet so much in the, in the focus of the concept of the Serbian world. This would be a last point. Um, okay, thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm open for questions. Okay, so maybe I do have a question. Um, so you, you talked about that idea that there's also um, the idea of genocide uh, in Syria and also in Russia. Is there also the idea to legitimize uh, expansion and war maybe in Syria? So the uh, Russian war in Syria as a part of that uh, narrative of the uh, Russian world to say, we have also to expand as a ethne, as the ethnicity. We have to expand the Russian world, or is it only um, concentrated on the um, let's say historical areas where Russians have lived for let's say less? Yeah, um, I think the actions in Syria or Libya or Africa mm -hmm. can be seen in this global setting. Um, if this is also beyond the military involvement, um, connected to the cultural level, actually there, there was this concert of classical music in Palmyra after the um, conquest or liberation by Syrian and Russian forces. Um, so this, there is a connection to this cultural mission on the global uh, um, level. And this might, this could be more intensive, but I think it has, been, not, has not been the first priority. I think it's more obvious the, the military um, dimension in these cases. Um, Russia, or Dugin sees Russia in close cooperation with Iran, which has been reactivated. There were the, the actual Iranian president recently was in Moscow, and there was talk about a strategic partnership and about our space in the world. And um, on the other hand, there's an interest in Turkey, which is switching or playing both plays. Um, as you know, um, there, but there's, there's, there was a competition about Syria between Turkey and Russia and Libya, of course, or also conflict. Um, both concepts at the moment, I, I think, are more mili in the military point of view important, or as an interaction with the United States, with NATO, or against with NATO or against NATO. If it's the case of Turkey, which is switching the size or playing both games, it has a neo-Ottomanic uh, view on the region. Um, but I think the Ottoman dimension of the, of the Russian world uh, is, is evolving and uh, um, plays a role if there is now um, 
a connection of a Syrian um, scenery with the warfare of Ukraine, the general responsible for the war in Ukraine on the Russian side, um, is Dvornikov, that this is the one was responsible for Aleppo, for the Syrian interaction in Russia. Most of the generals who were killed in Ukraine, the Russian generals, were active in Syria before or in Chechnya or both. Um, so again, there's a, but there's not, not necessarily uh, is, are these wars, wars comparable, but in the special um, section of, war, of civic warfare, or warfare, urban warfare, of course, it's the same strategy. Yes. Thank you. I'm uh, probably one of the similar question uh, that I uh, asked Oliver. Sorry for that. I'm trying to get to the idea of the spatial dimension of post Kimir and how it was you know, constructed and changing over time. So, um, what is post Kimir uh, today if you could put it on the map? What, is, what are the boundaries of this post Kimir, yeah. you know, Putin's government, if you could put it on the map? And how, what are the, you know, the concept, how it was developing for the last century? I think. Um... Uh, the new concepts in 2007 uh, was uh, the whole world in a cultural point of view, as the Goethe Institute or the Cervantes or Dante Institute, as well, Russian language courses, Russian culture in Ecuador or Venezuela or uh, Africa and Western Europe, etc. That's a global point which is continuing, but there are other levels which are intensifying and this is then the near abroad or the, the post Soviet, the post socialist contest in Europe or Central Asia, and the Near East, which is maybe in between of the, those levels, um, or which is important for the military level, which is a, maybe a special um, spatial configuration, which is more important than the Russian world, and is on the other hand then connected as a um, Legitima on the leg legitima legitimation level to the Russian world. Um, Putin himself not, not necessarily all the time speaks about the Russian world, it's the Russian civilization or Russian history. The Russian empire is actually more important in his speeches. Or of course, the Second World War and the spheres of influence or Yalta. Um, these concepts are actually more important in his speeches than the Russian world. So uh, he is over legitimating what he is doing on several levels, and the Russian world is just one uh, instrument in this in these several legitimate trials or attempts at legitimating what he is doing. Yeah, if I can build on this question very brief, just very briefly. Would you say that Ruskimir then is a sort of a more popular part of this geopolitical agenda by like, having it reflected in cultural programs and um, I don't know education and uh, at the field of like the, transmitting an idea to the broader public instead of debating it on a state level? Yeah. Well, it's, for the local actors, it can, they always can say, well, it's just about culture, it's just about the Russian language. Um, so that, well, there are universities in Germany or Austria who are cooperating with the Ruskimir, so that I'm in look. So there are Russian language courses at the university uh, sponsored by the foundation. And at the first glance, there's nothing to say against it. Well, it's, it's just uh, not an institution, like I said, as the Goethe Institute, etc. And mm -hmm. only if you, if you put the dots together, uh, that then it's part of hybrid warfare. And also about the Russian civilizational war against the rest of the world. And again, that this is not so much an overinterpretation. Mm -hmm. There are these texts, and, and, and it's just it's a parallel uni universe which is part um, of the main mission. 
I would say, at least after February 2022, I think there's no much room of discussion anymore about um, who's, who is hiding or they can't hide anymore. Actually, there's, there's no room more for cooperation. Um, and nobody can say that this is somehow um, unproblematic anymore. You have another question. I would just be interested in, in the bigger picture. So, would you say that there is, that this is something entirely specific for Russian and Serbian politics? Because my assumption was that a lot of countries do have some geopolitical concepts connected to a cultural mission, for example, Turkey, Hungary. So, on a methodological level, why did you select these cases and did you say there is something from a comparative advantage when looking at these, these cases? Are they the same or is there a difference? Yeah, thank you. Of course, we have to contextualize all this. Uh, the Hungarian cultural mission of, uh, with Orban. Uh, already is in, in the same theater. Of course, I would agree, but Orban also has a special situation in this context and is not anymore um, the liberal point of view, so, but an explicit illiberal expansionistic um, um, att attempt to reconceive um, Hungary the, within the territory of the crown of Stefan, St. Stefan, which includes parts of Romania, Slovakia, Croatia, etc. This, this is the context of Orban, which is also, I, th I don't actually know if he exactly uses the term Hungarian bronze. No, I think it's the Stefan's crown, the crown of St. Stefan or Hungary and the historical territories. He just opened a large monument in Budapest about uh, Trianon with all the lost provinces. Um, and this, the, the message there is also quite clear that the uh, ultimate agenda is to regain these um, territories. Of course, this is in um, contradiction to uh, the Constitution and the European Union, etc. He, he won't do this by warfare. I'm not convinced yet. No, of course he won't do it. But the discourse actually is evolving quite comparable to the Russian world in, um, in the Turkish situation. You had Stavut all or the deep um, in the, 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 the deep history. Um, he had a zero problems approach to the neighbors of Turkey and was trying to build on um, cooperation with everyone. Th this policy picks didn't work uh, with Erdogan. It's in, the, in this phase we can observe now there was a more um, direct warfare um, intermingling in Syria or now. Um, let's don't talk that the Greek islands in the Aegean remain um, without military conflict, but there is a history of military conflicts and Lausanne has been questioned by Erdogan in the last years, the frontiers has been, have been questioned. I thought this was more in, in the context of Syria, but maybe also Greek, Greece as the war plans is weak throughout again. But um, it's not about the Turkish world, um, not the same concept, not directly. And again, um, there's a the Turkish culture institution, cultural institutions, yes. And then that's the same, uh, the British Council or the uh, concept of Francophonia, that's the same. But there's, there's no, the, the British military um, doesn't argue with the empire anymore. It's a more disguised discourse, at least. Uh, they don't claim to imperialize the British Council or the, the French mission is not explicitly talking about the French empire. The term empire has not been um, rehabilitated. In the Russian case, it is rehabilitated in an explicit point or in the explicit discourse, NATO, pro forma, 
acts only um, in consent and in defense, um, you know, the discussions about interventions, etc. but at least they try to save their face. And it's not about um, the open aggression or annihilation of neighbors or the annexation of provinces of neighboring states. This hasn't occurred in Europe since the Second World War. That's the context Putin is opening in a quite deliberate manner. Okay, uh, there are no other questions by now. I think we should switch to the third and last presentation. So I would uh, like to introduce Claudia Eckert. Claudia Eckert is a PhD in the School of Social Science at Manchester, where she writes uh, her dissertation titled Lift Geopolitics, the Production of Space and Political and Economic Imaginaries of Bazaar Traders in Ukraine in Kyrgyzstan. Um, she also works as a research assistant at the Center of East European and International Studies at the Soyuz in um, Berlin, where she is involved in a DFL project called Limb Spaces, Living with Uncertainty, Strategies of Adaption and Horizons of Expectation in Ukraine and Moldova. Claudia has uh, two forthcoming publications, one in the European Asia Studies Journal titled People Pointed a Finger at Us, Emotions of Shame and Pride in the Biographies of Female Charter Traders in post of Russia, and one in the Journal of Ethnology about doing ethnographic research in times uh, of the pandemic. Okay, so we're going to have to begin. So I'll um, hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so last presentation, the last slot of this conference. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, I would I would like to bring another angle to geopolit geopolitics than we have heard today so far, and uh, I think it can be quite complementary actually. Um, the title of my presentation is Live Geopolitics, Strategic Narratives and Local Responses of Traders at Container Markets in Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan. And um, before I start, just some impressions from the sites where I conduct my research. Um, here you see uh, the market, the seven kilometer market in Odessa which is in the outskirts of the city. And you also have the Dordoy Bazaar in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan. And both are quite comparable. So in terms of the extensions, they have 170 hectares um, of double stack shipping containers, um, 60,000 to 150,000 people work there. It's hard, to, it's hard to say, it's impossible to say how many these are actually. Then um, there are uh, similar import countries. Most of the products are imported from China and Turkey, among others. Um, and at Dordoy, they are further retailed to mostly Russia, but to some extent also other cis countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. At the seven kilometer market, they are further retailed in wholesale quantities to Moldova mostly, and before 2014 also to Russia and Belarus. Um, so what is interesting about these markets, like I could, I could talk for hours about the material quality of the containers as such, like how what is the sensory effect of living and working in, from these containers or um, what is the symbolic meaning also of these like markets that are like cities made from containers? But um, that's not that's not really the focus today. So I, I, I rather want to attract your attention to the fact that these these markets were not pre-planned sites of economic exchange. They emerged quite say um, spontaneously in the times of the dissolution of the Soviet Union where people gathered and started to reselling goods because of scarcity of products and also jobs, and the general liberalization of um, the economy. Um, then with time, they kind of institutionalized themselves and developed a very organic and largely informal structure. So another thing that I won't talk about today, even if that would be interesting as well, like the structure of the market, but what is important is that this market is made from like all these containers and this also symbolizes the fact that the market is the sum of the of, of, of its of its units you know? it's like 
um, there are hundreds and thousands of people working who bring their own connectivities to these markets. So they are traveling across uh, nations, regions, economic zones, and bring goods, ideas, and uh, develop infrastructures in that way on the, on, from a very important sort of, uh, practice. But to give you a picture of how this uh, really looks, um, like what, what do traders do, or also consumers that come to the market, I will take you on a one-day trip of uh, um, someone who wants to buy whole scale at the market. So the first thing you do in the very morning, you check the currency exchange rate. You look at if it's cheaper for you to buy in, like this is in Dordoy now. If you buy in SOM, which is the local currency, if you buy in ruble or in dollars. So there is like hundreds of cash machines and banks where you can also get a microcredit very spontaneously in the morning. So you just find the best way to get to money and then you can go on and you find some um, carriers for you because your load will be heavy. So you find some people to carry that for you and you start to walk through the market. You have a look at all the different containers, whatever you're interested in, you will find it there. There is um, there's jar that's made in Kyrgyzstan, there is import uh, textiles. You can find all kinds of uh, different sorts of products. Once you have decided and chosen what you want, you hand it over to your carrier and um, you can have like a budget version, you can have luxury version. Like there's no limit to choice. You can have even a coffee in between and you have to be fast because the market is a family friendly place. So it closes at four o'clock in the evening and then stuff should very rapidly be brought to the next cargo uh, shipment shop, which is also at the market. There are plenty of them. You probably know where you want your cargo to go to. There are like hundreds of cities which can be reached from the market directly. You hand over your stuff, it's gonna be packed. It's a very informal and sort of analog process, nothing digital, digitalized. And then the stuff gets loaded, goes to the destination and you can just uh, yeah. uh, go back home, travel back home or um, yeah, hang out at the market another day. So, that's how it works. And how is this all related to um, geopolitics? Well, um, what these market traders really, really need in order to be successful is low tariffs, low regulation, and a potential to grow in terms of space, space and a lot of um, infrastructural connections. Um, and what these markets uh, characterize is that they are locally entangled and they exist through transnational connectivities. They depend on these uh, various special economic zones, B and multilateral economic agreements, and they do channel a lot of goods, people, and ideas from one place to another. And in the end, um, the markets in Bishkek and in, uh, in Odessa, they are not without a reason. They are where they are and have survived over time in contrast to many others of these spontaneous markets that you mentioned in the 90s. And uh, it's important to keep in mind that they are located at a sort of crossroads, sometimes in between or peripheries of larger expansive economic projects. And um, so, uh, Today, what I would like to do is to look at how top-down geopolitical imaginaries and especially uh, strategic narratives that justify um, uh, particular politics are being uh, mirrored, but also negotiated or refuted among traders at the market. And um, I, will, I will do so by really looking at this, what I call it, nitty gritty of geopolitics, like the, the very verb, like the practices that are done in order to make geopolitics happen, bring them into existence more than on the discursive level. And um, yeah, I mean, 
And this is all based on 14 months of ethnographic fieldwork online in a place which I have just finished. I've been a couple of months in uh, Odessa, slightly longer in Bishkek. And um, there I, yeah, I really learned about how deeply the traders' realities and business practices are entangled in um, various larger economic or geoeconomic and geopolitical dynamics. And, um, and yeah, let's, let's just have a look at what are these kind of dynamics that are affecting traders. So this is, on this map you can see the two largest um, economic frameworks that, that we have in, in Europe. This is the European Union, obviously, with uh, association agreements with Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. And uh, we have the Eurasian Economic Union, which consists of Russia, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Belarus, and Kyrgyzstan. And um, yeah, so these are all pretty clearly economic um, formations. But uh, yeah, as an anthropologist, I'm really much more interested in how they, like what effects do they have, do they have on people's life? How do they materialize? And how do people narrativize their own experiences with these formations? Uh, so in practice, like what, what does it mean that China promotes, for instance, the free movement of goods through Eurasia? But in practice, it turns out that traders at the market um, have much less chances to uh, be profitable than their uh, Chinese peer traders. Or how do Kyrgyz traders position themselves towards Russia, knowing that their own strategic advantage in Kyrgyzstan will be dissolved once the country um, becomes a member of the Eurasian Economic Union? Or what does happen to like traders in Ukraine who, uh, uh, once the war started, have lost all their all their clients from Crimea or the Donbas? So what does it make with their their own geopolitical imaginaries? Um, I would, yeah, I would like to give a very, very brief <coughs> conceptual background and introduce the concept that I used to work with in, um, in this presentation and also in the chapter that uh, is on the base of it. Then I would like to uh, briefly compare strategic narratives in relation to Eurasian Economic Union membership debates in Kyrgyzstan and in Ukraine, and um, give you some ideas of how these are negotiated among traders at the market. Um, the first question is maybe, what do we mean when talking about geopolitics? Apart from the fact that there are countless definitions, there is one that is very, very easy and very simple, and this is used to lose it, like, a term that is used to loosely describe the politics of spatializing politics. It's very neutral. Uh, geopolitical discourse then uses these very simple explanations to create an aura of control and, uh, and a vision for the future. What they, what, what geo, like talking geopolitics very often means to apply strategic narratives. And strategic narratives work in a way that they produce a shared meaning of the past, the present, and the future, which in turn justify all kinds of domestic and uh, foreign politics. In the late 80s, then, the critical geopolitics intervened by pointing to the power structure that is behind the making of geopolitics. And they really examine how strategic narratives, for example, on foreign, foreign policy, military mobilization, territory, and resource allocation, produce representative representations of the world that much more serve the interests of those, and here in brackets, typically men, who represent them. But how do you study them? Well, you, there are some suggestions, and um, I sort of follow them, I find them useful, is, you look at which actors uh, appear in these narratives, what kind of events seem to be relevant, how they produce temporalities and spatialities. And you look at um, the narrative structure. So where do they start? What is the state of the art that they present now? And how do they produce the policies that they apply as a means to what end? 
Um, but uh, yeah, we have this, but that's still on the kind of discursive level, no? understanding what, um, so say, what is the political, what is the, what is the allied discourse here? This is what we can do with uh, deconstructing strategic narratives. But we need, we need more. And um, that's what I call an anthropology of lived geopolitics. And here, I think it's really useful to look at the mundane level, um, uh, like how, how, how the space is produced between propaganda and pragmatics. And uh, roughly speaking, lived geopolitics then refers to this multiple dynamics that contribute to reflections about one's own place in the world in relation to large scale geopolitical discourses. So I seek to foreground the productive um, tension between, say, the multiple factors and actors that contribute to uh, the making of geopolitical imaginaries. Um, let's then go to the first example, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union. In my presentation, I will focus on the Eurasian Economic Union. I would love to go through Baldwin Road Initiative and European Union as well, but I think I'm already over time. <laughs> so uh, let's first outline the official goals of the Eurasian Economic Union and then compare different discourses and concerns that evolved during the membership debate with Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Ukraine who turned down the offer in 2014 and Kyrgyzstan joined in in 2015. Um, the, the treaty on the Eurasian Economic Union was signed in 2014 between Belarus, uh, Kazakhstan and Russia. And its priorities were defined as a limiting intra bloc tariffs and establishing a common external tariff policy. So pretty economic base. Moreover, within the union's boundaries, there was, just like in the European Union, free movement of goods, capital, services, and people. Um, then it was, it was the political leaders of Belarus and Kazakhstan who often emphasized that they imagined the Eurasian economy as a bridge from China or the Baden Road Initiative to the European Union. This is not quite coinciding with the way in which Putin framed the Eurasian expansion or the Union's expansion. And he um, mentioned that for him, the Union's extensions should go across all the previous borders of the Soviet Republic and also balance the US, China, and EU power blocks. Then um, he, uh, yeah, he calls this, Formation Eurasia, which we know, and this is also now referring to what we, what we heard before. And here, Eurasia is really used as a very, very powerful um, uh, conceptual tool to create strategic narratives because it gives a collective, yet region specific um, meaning to a cohesive past, present, and future for all this like uh, territory that, that, is, that is integrated to Eurasia. And um, that's, yeah, as like Madin Danwell is very, very uh, prolific writer on, on this concept and how it has re-emerged in, in post-Soviet Russia, um, popularized obviously by Gumilyov and, and uh, Dungan and uh, this like, they introduce a sort of neo-Eurasianism, which is a mixture of Russian imperial tradition, but also very much blended with fascist ideology. So here, um, we need to be careful. And then in the membership debate with others, other observing countries like Ukraine, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and Moldova, the debate was that much more pragmatic and much less ideological in theory. So, um, for Kyrgyzstan, the, um, yeah, the advantage to join the Eurasian economic space would be especially the free movement of goods and people. So about 33% um, of Kyrgyz GDP comes from remittances from uh, a real army of labor migrants who works in Russia, and their work and stay in Russia could be legalized through uh, membership. 
And um, when when Kyrgyzstan joined the Eurasian Economic Union, back then President Atambayev put it that this is the lesser of two evils. Um, so in Kyrgyzstan, two projects compete a bit. This is the Violet Road Initiative and the Eurasian Economic Union. And it's often said that uh, Kyrgyzstan did not really have a choice because they were in such a dire economic, or they are still, but back then, in such a such a dire economic situation that they couldn't really make a choice, but only try to leverage the best condition for themselves. So then um, the Kyrgyz population actually is quite in favor, like seemingly much more than Kyrgyz politicians, in favor of the um, Eurasian Economic Union and, their, and the country's membership. So here we have the data from 2017 onwards, but in 2015, um, uh, public support of membership was at 86%, like the highest of all member countries. And the main factors for integration back then were Chinese, like the fear against uh, Chinese expansion, the strong dependency on remittances, and the hope for a revived Soviet like welfare system. So, this uh, promise of a, a second stage of the Soviet Union. And my findings from the fieldwork at the Dordoy uh, Bazaar in 2019, when I was there first to look at the consequences of uh, the country's accession, were that um, back then the negative implication of this multilateral trade agreement, which would dissolve all the free tariff zones that had been established with non-member countries before, like China and Turkey. So importing products was much more expensive because it was then within the union's borders. And, uh, and this had terrible consequences for traders who were often bankrupt and um, uh, uh, lost their means of income. But uh, in, in almost none of the conversation interviews I had, this overshadowed shadowed the enthusiastic attitude towards Russia. So this, the fact that their economic opportunities had been destroyed did not project on to their attitude um, towards, especially Putin, who is a sort of an ideal figure, figure of, uh, of a real leader for a country. And there are especially socioeconomic concerns prevailed, of course, because um, uh, um, in Kyrgyzstan, there is uh, absolutely no uh, state support in terms of uh, social welfare. Then when I came back to the Dordoe Bazaar in 2021, the situation had changed. Mostly um, voices were much more like critical towards Russia. And I was wondering if this might be related to uh, uh, the country's succession to the Eurasian Economic Union and its long-term negative consequences. But it turned out that it was quite the contrary. Like many people profited. Many people were able to uh, take advantage of their position and then instead of importing ready-made clothes from China or Turkey, they uh, rather imported much cheaper raw material like fibers and textiles and started the production line of textiles made in Kyrgyzstan, which they could, could sell to the Russian markets, which was a very profitable business. Nonetheless, um, their attitude towards Russia was much, much more critical than before. And as it turned out, this was closely related to the fact that in the meantime, like many people had already returned from Russia and were not that enthusiastic about their real lived experiences over there as a labor migrant. And as well, the, the payment did not, did not differ that much from what you could earn in Kyrgyzstan anymore. In addition to that, there were a couple of um, border conflicts with Tajikistan and Russia sided with the Tajik side. So in general, Russian popularity had suffered. And this also shows that like Russian, Russian popularity in the region is not, is not nothing stable. It's nothing that Putin can rely on or uh, that Russian politics can rely on. And I think that, um, yeah, the, um, the micro experiences of people <laughs> really ultimately, ultimately change these, like also collective uh, geopolitical imaginaries. 
And uh, I think it's yeah, just another good example why you, like ethnographic research can really help to understand how these dynamics change as well, because, because here you see how, how, how they are made sense of and um, how, how they also change in perception. So finally, um, one example from, or the example from debates on Euro Eurasian Economic Union versus European Union in, in Ukraine. As we know now, Ukraine's uh, rejection to be integrated into the Russian sphere of power revealed exactly the features of neo-Eurasianism that we had been talking about before. And um, the prelude to the current war in Ukraine began in 2013, uh, when back then Victor, uh, President Viktor Yanukovych decided to turn down the association agreement with the European Union and join the Russian uh, customs union instead. Um, the critics of the um, uh, association agreements with the European Union said that this would result for Ukraine in austerity measures and economic recession similarly to the fate of Greece. So the, the situation of like uh, um, uh, austerity measures in southern Europe, but especially Greece, they were taken as a sort of a, uh, evil picture of what the European Union intends to do with Ukraine. And um, well, Ukraine didn't have much, much uh, choice, but because their public debt in 2014 posed a threat to national bankruptcy. So they, need, they, were, they were urgently in need of money and the, the only bailout available was either membership in the European Union or the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, Russia offered cheap credits without extensive economic reforms and, um, and called or, or warned that Ukraine's mem uh, signing of the association agreement would be a suicidal step for the, for the country. But then the Euromaidan events put an end to the source and back between Russian, pro Russian, and pro European um, politics. And uh, later, after Yanukovych was ousted, Poroshenko signed the agreement. And here we go. You know how, how the situation continued. So, but now let's zoom into the market and see how the membership debate uh, turned out effective. For the, for the traders at the 70 meter market. Um, over the year 2022, I conducted about 30 interviews with, online, with traders online and in place. And um, I've been talking with market administration, traders, uh, carriers, drivers, all kind of personnel. And there can be no doubt, like there was a clear um, like experience that 2014 was a watershed moment for traders. The market business never recovered from that shock and from the loss of clients from the, uh, Crimea and Donbass. And um, the same kind of uh, common sense timeline divided the market business into the good years, which were the years before the war, and the, um, and the years since, where the market has constantly been dying. This is how they say, like, and this is like, um, it's not even that traders argue that in a, in a sort of a, uh, angry way, it's just accepted that this was the prelude to the dying of the, of, the, of the market also because they feel that they are sort of outdated. Like people buy now in boutiques in the city, this market is not a comfortable space. And, that they that very very they're like modern young Ukrainian people would like to do their shopping, and um, the, they also know that they will be replaced by digital marketplaces, and all this gave a sort of a uh, aura of extinction to analog market. And yet there were some they were some able to transform their businesses, and. Um, they were able to even survive the pandemic, but now when the European Union guidelines come into it, or the, the association agreement guidelines come into, in, in, into effect in January 2022, basically, which means that uh, traders need cash registered and standardized labels for the products that they sell, and this is just the end for this type of informal trade. So one can say that for traders, 
um, the, they, their businesses might have flourished under the loose regulations which characterize the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, but um, yeah, they were, they were not drawing the simple conclusions that, oh, well, if only we had joined in the Eurasian Economic Union, we would still be very, very um, uh, successful with our businesses. Quite the contrary. I found much more nuanced opinions on, uh, of traders about how they see their own position in relation to larger formations. So I will read out two quotes and conclude what I'm here done. Uh, here, this is an um, informant like the mother of a five year old girl who has been working at, on the market for more than 20 years. And um, when we were discussing about whether the country should stay with Russia or with the West, she said, I don't, I don't think so, you know, I think we should be an independent state. For me, this is like a family and children are not obliged to live with their parents. My mother is alive, but for some reason, I wanted to live on my own. I feel good the way it is. My mother comes to visit us without any problems, but if she lived with me permanently, then we wouldn't have such a peaceful relationship. There are people who believe that we are so dependent on Russia that we cannot live without her, that we will die as a country, as a nation. That's what they think. But I don't think so. Let there be three people living here. We will give birth to healthy children. We will raise them and we will let them go. This is how we can revive the nation. So it's a very picture, it's a very um, emblematic way of uh, arguing for a, for a young Ukraine that can be independent and that doesn't necessarily be integrated into one or another uh, um, larger and more powerful geo-economic imaginary. And the uh, second and last quote that I would like to share with you is a completely different perspective. And this is someone who argued for, or who was afraid that Ukraine will be divided into, into more than the sum of its parts, um, and then had a very bleak geopolitical vision, actually. He said that, when things continue the way they go now, then our country will simply be fragmented. I see what the Poles are doing, the Hungarians, I see what the Romanians are doing. Everyone wants to tear off their peace. The Romanians want Bessarabia, which means the entire Odessa region. Poles want Western Ukraine, Hungarians want, want Transcarpathia. Everyone in the West sees that Russia distributes passports in Crimea and the East. They don't see that Hungary distributes passports in Western Ukraine. This is then the European Union, which means free travel, jobs, social security. There will be a referendum and people will think, why should I stay in Ukraine? They will show me in Hungary, Poland and Romania, and that will be a democratic decision. In Crimea, however, the democratic countries call it annexation. I am not for Russia, but I think each country needs to find a way on its own without others imposing their will on them. So um, these interlocutors have mixed backgrounds. They uh, have Russian, Ukrainian, Tatars, uh, Gagauzians, like this is the Odessa region where people have really a lot of, lots of different roots. But um, I think here, uh, yeah, what, what, what the, what I really found quite often was this idea that, that Ukraine needs to find a way on its own, somewhere in between, and that this, like, especially among traders, this position of being in between can actually be used to your own, say, benefit, uh, and that, um, Joining in the Eurasian Economic Union or the European Union would be similar or equal to losing one's independence. And yeah, to conclude, uh, the aim of this, of this presentation was to problematize hegemonic discourses on Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan's place in relation to neighboring great powers. And um, I, I think that my examples, I hope my examples reveal that this concept of the geopolitics, which foregrounds like how these large scale top down and bottom up discourses intersect, um, 
can can really be an instrument to debunk the idea that geopolitics are exclusively made by the powerful. And that's that's where I want to finish. Okay, thank you from that in view from bottom up. Um, so are there questions? I have a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> I would like to as well. Thank you very much for that. And uh, it seems that you were, uh, you know, if you have a lot of to tell us much more than <laughs> we can get in. Um, but can I just uh, maybe, uh, maybe, you know, I'm not um, a geographer, so I might be struggling with the understanding for the concept of the mm -hmm. and the way you actually studied it. So, uh, is it was it like, um, you know, about politics and uh, everyday choices, everyday geographies of the people in the market, or how do you? How do you know first was approaching it? Because what I heard, and I might be misheard things, uh, but what I heard it, it was mostly focused on the interviews, so you were to be like, you know. And also, was it when you came up with the concept? How do you see it? Do you see it uh, as the again behavior in these two dots that you were into case studies that you were focusing on the markets? You know, as a sort of maybe the point where they will be revealing their uh, politics, or it's something which would, as I assume, would be also visible again in the beyond the markets, mm -hmm. or you study them beyond the markets, you know. So, could you just provide me with that? Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the concept came up in parallel to uh, um, many other. Uh, conceptual approach that start from the doing instead of the assuming. No? And um, here I was then, for me, it was a, a perfect fit to take the market as a prism to understand the doing of geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And especially creators who are so much into like in, in these tensions between narratives, because this is like these formations are publicly debated. They affect they affect them on all possible levels, like personal, professional, and um, and uh, and the space in between. And um, I would I would say that uh, how I approach this, or how 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 I conceptualize this, and how I use it methodologically was really to look at different scales. So one was um, the discursive level, and here a clear comparison, like you know. What what discourses or strategic narratives are around about the concept about the, the geopolitical imaginaries that I was interested with, this, which is these three EU, Eurasian Economic Union, and Belt and Road, and then you you are just attentive to the ways in which they circulate and also the the discursive elements that are attributed with them, like in in the Belt and Road narrative, this goes very much into the direction of connectivities. Uh, crossroads, like all these terminologies are constantly around and you can just try to understand how they, um, how they stick to, to the talk that you, that you engage with at the market. Do they resemble, are they adaptive, do they figure there? And then on the next level, this is the, this is the level of practice, it's like how have people changed importing and exporting and thinking about the possibilities of import and export over time, how have tariffs changed? Because like it's super interesting to see how Kyrgyz accession to the Eurasian Economic Union, which, which was supposed to be like the end to all trade, on the contrary, it produced a new market, and this is a local production, and that's booming now, like half the country is living from that. So it has significant outcomes that uh, affect a lot of people, and it's just the market is just like yeah, as I said, like the prism where it comes together. So uh, just to just to uh, conclude, so when we're talking about individual bodies in practice, we're looking on the economic activities of individuals on the markets and uh, how they and not necessarily they economic do. activities. No, it's just um, it's the way how you locate your practices and your strategies in uh, in, uh, in a larger like um, environment mm -hmm. and uh, in a sort of from a geopolitical uh, perspective, like you, you 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as long as geopolitical um, discourses figure in your own thoughts and practices, this is already the way in which it resembles on the mundane level and on the, on the individual level. You don't need necessarily to look at traders, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just curious what you were. So you, you were not the trader. No, no, no. This, this was this was a one case study okay. of something that can be like you also have like you have plenty of similar concepts, for instance, like uh, subaltern geopolitics, so, feminist yeah. geopolitics, anti-geopolitics, popular everyday, etc. <laughs> for me, it was important to look at this interface. So they look more usually at the like um, yeah uh, representations of those that are usually not heard, and I was more looking at yeah. how these interfaces come together. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think it's, it really makes sense, of course, to have the individuals, uh, the points of view, and this the European, the Eurasian economic union is an economic project at the first time, but, but the European Union was also an economic project at the beginning, at least. And then the markets really make sense. At the, at the end, you had also the um, political implications uh, in the um, within these economic contexts. Um, one comment from my side then would be that, well, there, um, there has not yet been an annexation by Transcarpathia. I mentioned Trianon. Of course, this is part of Orban's policy. That's why he is not supporting Ukraine, mm -hmm. but he did not yet do it. And mm -hmm. Poland, uh, I think that's really imaginary, or there's no ambition to do that. On the other hand, uh, um, Russia's involvement in Kazakhstan um, the, the, the point of the statehood of Kazakhstan has been um, put in question, I think um, in 2014 especially, but there's actually no tradition of statehood. This was a, main, this was a um, position by Putin. And at the moment, Kazakhstan is not supporting Russia in evading the sanctions, did not um, connect, um, recognize the independence of the LNR and DNR, um, for example. So, if on the one hand you had such views from, from the economic actors, do you have also Kazakh views on the cultural dimension or on the statehood dimension in the economic sphere um, or on the level of your actors? Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to distinguish between <laughs> Kazakh and Kyrgyz traders. Obviously, now I have insights from Kyrgyz traders, Sorry, I, and that's a, that's a really are. different story. So I would love to have been to the market in Almaty, but uh, I haven't I haven't yet had the chance to, to do interviews there. In in Kazakhstan state, uh, I'm sorry, in Kyrgyzstan statehood did not figure as a very popular concept. On the contrary, people were quite often saying that well, if only Putin would. We were happy if we were integrated back into the Russian sphere of power. Mm -hmm. And that was not a rare comment. So the, the, there is the idea, like with all these revolutions and all these failed governments, that Kyrgyzstan is just not able to sustain a uh, proper statehood or to, make, to build a proper statehood. Which might be changing, but um, like so far we had uh, three larger revolutions, each hosting the president at that time. And um, it's like, that, yeah, that, that's probably it's interesting. The fixed uh, like publicly announced that they won't support Russian troops in Kazakhstan, right? At the end of January. But they don't support no, Russia. They, yeah, they, well, they yeah, but this, 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 this coincide, coincide, coincide also with uh, Russian troops supporting the Tachik in the Kyrgyz yeah. Tachik border clash. Yeah. So yeah. they were quite angry about that. So. But if they like if Putin insisted, they would have to. They are bound by contract to join if they are caught. So. Okay, so uh, maybe I do also have an, um, maybe a question which goes more to the to the future you mentioned that um that now and when you have been last time in ukraine in the market that people are saying now maybe this market is not modern anymore 
so they uh, will shop online or wherever. So what does it mean for that um, live geopolitics when that market falls away? So do they, uh, are they in a way institutionalized or uh, part of the consciousness already that they would stay alive or would they disappear by um, breaking, uh, breaking up with the trade? Uh, live geopolitics would not disappear. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. That this is a concept that is not bound to the existence of markets. But um, I imagine that the, the, the angle of live geopolitics might help to understand why people who had lost their jobs that the market eventually might have a particular position in regard to larger geopolitical shifts as they concurred with their own biographical say, um, pathways. So if you lose your job or your existence after all because of um, uh, first losing all your clients from Russia and secondly, not being able to continue with this established way of informal trade as the country needs to comply with European standards, then like, people are usually uh, more clever than, than we might imagine so they, they, they can very well distinguish between like that some things are necessary even if they don't like them themselves obviously but it just means that um, they might be much more critical towards European standardization mm -hmm. and what this means for a country like U Ukraine which has profited from this like in doing, doing things a bit less regularly so and uh, that's just like it might be helpful in the future also to understand, like imagine that, that Ukraine uh, will be accepted to the European Union and uh, like all of these regulations start. And they are not that easy to comply with from one day to another. This is also like this is geo economies maybe more than geopolitics, but it also like impacts on your imaginary, no, and on like, like how you interpret these strategic narratives that are being used. Okay, so when there are uh, no uh, questions anymore, I think we uh, do a short wrap up because you have to leave now. No, no, I just want to briefly uh, two minutes wrap, wrap up because I, I think we have seen that in that panel, we have uh, seen that these um, strategic narratives and also geopolitical concepts um, are, uh, do have a revival in uh, situations in crisis, in global crisis, like we have it now in 2022, and it's also the connection maybe to the title of that conference to see if it is really 2000 or 2020 is kind of a watershed. I think uh, when you look at geopolitics, you see that um, in crisis, these concepts and narratives become really um, um, important again. And um, you also see how flexible they are and how uh, variable uh, they are and how they could be used in different contexts, in different national contexts, in different cultural contexts. And I think because of that, um, we will see uh, every time when there will be a global crisis, um, the ideas of lived geopolitics or geopolitical concept, like the Hawkland con con uh, concept will come up. And I think it was a really good, um, panel to show how it works on the conceptual level, what are the ideas behind it, and how on the other uh, side um, people are really um, doing geopolitics in practice, how they establish kind of spatial imaginaries in their own lives, so, and how this um, is connected to the conceptual and also the practical side of this, of this story. So thank you all uh, the participants here, speakers <laughs> in the panel. And uh, all those who were here. Thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a great discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.